Gentle viewers, here in my captedy little hands is almost a full long box of comics. Now, I know what you're thinking. Captain Logan, full long box of comics, who cares? You're at Geek Fusion headquarters. You got the bazillions of boxes of comics. Yes, our boxes of comics are beginning to reach the bazillions. You're not wrong. But importantly, what you're about to see, what you're about to feast your eyes upon, dear viewer, is, well, I said almost an entire box, I guess it's like two-thirds of a box. Everything you see here are books from the last several months that I have not touched yet. That's right, book, well, I've touched them because they're, they're here in this box, so clearly my, my fingerprints are on them, and if they were evidence for a crime scene, I could be implicated. But these are all books, these are all issues that I have yet to read. We've got some Uncanny X-Men, I'm probably eight, nine, ten issues behind on that, a whole bunch of X-Files. There's just, there's, there's, there's tons of stuff here, because I've been so busy working on the documentary and getting that out, getting back to, uh, oh, okay, okay, Super Secret Christ War, Crisis War I've, I've finished, but that's in here because I'm going to review it at some point. There's a few things in here that I just haven't reviewed yet that are here because I haven't reviewed them, but uh, I am behind, uh, Ninja Turtles Ghostbusters, I haven't read all of that yet, uh, but by and large, this is all stuff that I haven't gotten to because I haven't been reviewing new comics. As you can tell, as you've clicked on this video, Rapid Fire Comic Reviews has returned. Now, I was doing a show called Top 5, uh, uh, Captain Logan's uh, Top 5 of the Week, and I decided to go back to Rapid Fire so that I, could, I can hopefully, I, if I can learn the art of brevity, let you know what I read this week and what I think is worth picking up at the store so uh, I can help you out. And I've rearranged my schedule so that I can finally go to the store on Wednesdays and hopefully get this up for you most Thursdays. That's right. It's my gift for me to you. And then, eventually, the hope is to go back and do some of these uh, full story arcs and miniseries uh, for you on the vault. But I have a lot of catching up to do. So anyway, uh, just so everybody knows, I'm not caught up. There is quite a bit of stuff that I have that I have not finished, and I will be reviewing select things from my pull list that I have been keeping up on and that are easy to go ahead and review, review for you. So without further ado, here comes finally for the first time in months and months, rapid fire comic reviews. Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan and welcome once again to the Muscular and Corn Fed Comic Vault. It's time for Rapid Fire Comic Reviews. Yeah, bringing this show back. I've got nine brand new books for you this week and a couple more that I got but haven't had a chance to read yet. One of them, uh, The Mutanimals, uh, this is a four issue miniseries by IDW and Ninja Turtles and um, I read the first couple. I haven't gotten I haven't gotten caught up on this yet and uh, hopefully I can uh, get around to doing a review of the whole series for you here in the next week or two and then uh, all new X-Men, which I'm just issues and issues and issues behind on. So anyway, um, everything else though, um, I am caught up on enough to uh, review for you, and and uh, we have um, a couple of uh, new number ones and uh, things like that this week, so uh, some brand new stuff. Um, really uh, nice mix of stuff this week. Part of the reason that I decided to go ahead and bring the show back now is because I was really astounded by how much of an eclectic assortment of books I had in my pull list this week, and I kind of just got excited to read everything, and uh, sat down and started reading stuff, and I kept reading, and all of a sudden I was finished with my stack. First time that's happened in months. And I said, you know what? Rapid Fire Comic Reviews. If you like doing it, let's bring it back. I want to give you a quick plug also, um, because I have in fact actually been reviewing some new comics in text form. That's right. Uh, using my digits instead of my vocal cords over on the Super Villain Network. That's where the Geek Solution Radio Hour is now, and I've also, I'm have also i also doing a column for them. Weekly column, uh, a uh, long in-depth excuse me, reviews of single issues, usually either number ones or thing or one shots, or um, I, I guess I've done one trade and then uh, sometimes I'll do things like just as they finish, uh, I'll do like the last issue and then give you a little bit of an, of an overview. Um, I've done nine of those so far. Um, last time I did the uh, the ending of Powerpuff Girls Super Smash Up, uh, the week before I think I did uh, the last issue of Star Wars, maybe it was even before that, um, and I've done uh, the 
Um, I did uh, a new collection of Riddler stories that just came out. Uh, so doing lots of different, different uh, an assortment of things over there. And that's part of the reason that I haven't been putting up comic vaults on single issues as I it was initially my plan. Um, I, just so folks know, I announced that before the Supervillain Network thing ended up cropping up and happening. And uh, they offered me a column and I uh, didn't want to turn it down. Uh, I really kind of miss doing that kind of writing. And that, in fact, helped me to um, it really spurred me on into in the, uh, getting my head back into the rewind space, and so uh, I'm kind of writing a lot now again, and um, really, really excited and happy to be back into my writing place. So anyway, let's go ahead and get right into it. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about each of the books that I got this time and what I thought of them. Let's begin, shall we, with Marvel, and we're going to begin with Marvel's Star Wars and Darth Vader. Yeah, both the same week, and I think this is the first time this has happened. They both come out at the same time. Uh, this is really a appropriate, of course, because uh, the events of each of these are really happening simultaneously and affect each other really hard. And that's been the case throughout this. Uh, I really love that we're in kind of this Marvel Star Wars status quo right now. Uh, somehow we're rather striking this fantastic balance of feeling like a Marvel book, but also uh, feeling like, especially with you know the main Star Wars book, um, getting that, uh, that tone and spirit of the original trilogy. And of course modernize it in the sense that it is affected by the prequels, and um, these two particular issues affected more by Clone Wars than um, anything I've seen so far for Marvel Star Wars, um, because Darth Vader is finally, um, I guess I'm, and I guess, uh, minor spoiler alert, and I try not to give too many spoilers in, on the show, but th these are not real, um, these are not real real heavy with a lot of events. Uh, it, th these are really action-driven issues. So to talk about them at all, I kind of have to give away the big thing, which is pretty much just this is where Darth Vader f f uh, finds out that Luke Skywalker is out there. Um, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll say that. And so uh, the stuff from the end of Revenge of the Sith, when, uh, the, when, when uh, Luke and Leia are being born, uh, affects this. So uh, there's that... And and then there's um, there's some other things like uh, in the in the Vader book. I guess I'm reviewing these simultaneously. Uh, why not? That's appropriate. Uh, the the Vader book uh, has kind of a, kind of a neat, interesting connection to uh, General Grievous. Uh, there's somebody who uses uh, his his technology to kind of kind of save themselves from life support. Uh, and and uh, I, I thought save themselves. Wow, really? Okay. Uh, to save himself from life support. And um, that was that was kind of an interesting idea. So um, as much as I'm not a real big fan of the, the prequel material, I think some of the um, some of the current Star Wars stuff has been finding really cool ways to use that stuff and uh, make it feel more relevant and valid, at least to me. Uh, and so I'm really liking a lot of that. Uh, but as I said, these are incredibly fast reads. I mean, less than five minutes a piece for, e for each of them. Well, this one sh is certainly, certainly quick. I can't say shorter, same page count, um, but quicker than this one. This one's a little bit more dialogue driven, uh, but still really uh, a, a whole bunch of action. And uh, so with the Star Wars book, uh, basically all that's going on in this issue is uh, a really cool confrontation between Boba Fett and Luke Skywalker. And Boba Fett has been hired by Darth Vader uh, per last issue to uh, go find um, whoever it was that he was dealing with uh, in the first couple issues, and he doesn't know that it's Luke Skywalker, and, and um, so Boba Fett's been doing research, and he's figured out uh, uh, who it is, and um, finally is able to get Darth Vader um, a name, and so they have this big uh, this big confrontation, and I love their banter back and forth. Um, I love how assertive Luke Skywalker is in this. Uh, he could really easily be Characterized um, in this period, I think even I uh, even even after four as kind of. Um is kind of you, you know you know really super unsure of himself, and I mean he he is that he certainly is is this certainly is of course still a coming of age story, and he's not uh, fully decided who he is and what he's about, and he hasn't uh, you know I, I, he's not a Jedi yet, so of course he's going to have to later on, as we see in the films, deal with um, his feelings and his emotions and stuff. But he's assertive, he's proactive, uh, he's got a little bit of 
a um, he's got some spunk to him, and I really love that uh, Aaron is characterizing him that way. And uh, a lot of fun to see him him and Boba Fett fight. I uh, can't wait to hear what Dan Torrey has to say about this when he gets to it because uh, he loves Boba Fett. I think he's really gonna like the way that Aaron's writing him. Um, there's a thing in in this uh, that I won't give away regarding Han Solo that I imagine some people are going to be a little bit uh, uh, weirded out by and maybe even up in arms about. Um, we'll see where it goes. Uh, the the stuff with him and Leia, um, I've been enjoying their banter back and forth, but it, it was starting to get a little bit old. Okay, I get it. You guys at this point don't like each other, and we get the dynamic. We've lived with that a lot. And then there's a thing here that's kind of um, shaken that up a little bit, but could end up, if it's not played right, more obnoxious than that. So we'll see how that ends up going. Uh, the uh, Regarding the Vader book, um, I think there's a, there's maybe a little bit too much time uh, spent in this um, elongating a scene that we see at the end of this, uh, and basically it's just uh, Vader, he, he has a big reaction at the end of this uh, to um, finding out about Skywalker, and then when you get to Luke Skywalker, then you get to this, and um, we see what Vader's been doing leading up to that um, in, in connection to the last issue, and I love how tightly woven these are. It's fantastic. But you get to the end of this, and he is uh, flashing back to some stuff that we've seen before uh, uh, as as we're getting to that reaction, and I don't really know that we needed that. I think um, it's kind of neat because it's from his perspective. You know, this is his book, so here we get everything from the good guy's perspective, and here we get everything from the bad guy's perspective, and I really like that. Uh, it's, it's like if you took all the villain scenes that you usually get in a movie and just gave it its own book so that you are, you, you are squarely, consistently with the protagonists of the piece, and then you get over to the villain side and you make them a protagonist and you see the other side of it, which is really neat when you're dealing with what's supposed to kind of be pure good and pure evil. And I think we do a really good job of making Vader a uh, sympathetic and interesting character without, without humanizing him too much. Uh, once again, tough to strike that balance, uh, handled really well there. But uh, we're stretching that stuff just a little bit. Really love Vader and Palpatine's uh, dynamic together, and uh, Palpatine, uh, we're, we're discovering, uh, has not always been sure um, about Vader and has been kind of uh, planning for potentially replacing him if that ever needs to happen, and uh, here we get to see kind of some, uh, as, as Heath Ledger Joker uh, says in The Dark Knight, tryouts, uh, and that's a lot of fun. So anyway, as I said, uh, really action-driven uh, issues. These are not the, the densest we've had um, for this, but a whole lot of fun, and um, I certainly you know wouldn't recommend starting with these, um, although, I mean, I think they are pretty readable on their own, uh, and if you like Star Wars and um, you are behind and you happen to pick, um, especially these both up together, uh, you probably, I would imagine you might be hooked right away um, if this period for Star Wars is your bag um, and, uh, and, and, the, and the, the art in both of them is just absolutely glorious. So anyway, I uh, highly, highly recommending these and uh, since we are uh, to six now with each of these, uh, we're about to get the trades for both of them, which I don't know how those are going to read separately because this stuff is so interwoven. It's been really fun to read these kind of back and forth each week. It's been sort of like, uh, you know, watching Arrow and Flash uh, where, where you know, that show sometimes there's, there's, there's crossover and it's kind of fun to uh, watch them simultaneously. This, of course, even more so and it's handled in incredibly well. Um, it'll be. I, I, I think those those trades. I haven't looked into. I think those trades are being published separately. Um, so it would be interesting to see. You know, if you could read Star Wars and then read Vader, and if it reads as well as as these, because I think you could get away with putting out a, kind of a mega trade and just put these in the issues in the order in which they were you know published in the first place. So anyway, uh, highly recommending the Star Wars stuff. Let's go ahead and move on now to uh, Secret Wars number three. And uh, I haven't, of course, because I haven't been doing the show, had a chance to weigh in really on Secret Wars at all, at, at least on the channel. And I did do um, a... Uh, pretty in-depth review of the first issue over on Supervillain Networks. Again, uh, feel free to run over there and uh, read that if you're interested in um, my initial thoughts when it started. Uh, 
That issue um, just absolutely crushed me, and as I keep saying, um, as I said there, in the very best way. Um, I love the way Hickman's been handling this thing. Uh, I didn't like the idea of rebooting Marvel, of rebooting 616. Uh, it's a thing that I can kind of understand why why it's being done and trying to find a way to incorporate Miles Morales and stuff like that because not nobody's caring anymore about much of the rest of the Ultimate Universe and stuff. And so, you know, there's, there's reasons to, to fold some of this together, and regardless of whether or not it's a good idea, it, it, is a, it has been, unlike 52, it has been a thing that we've built, been building to for a long, long time, like three years. Uh, it's been clear that all this time travel and all this interdimensional travel and stuff has been messing with the, with the universe, and it's affected nearly every story, and uh, the editors have, have done a remarkable job of making all of that consistent and making it feel like everybody's on the same page and um, making it feel like uh, one really well interconnected continuity and keeping everybody as um, generally uh, pretty well in character between each of the books. Uh, and I, I really, really appreciate that. So even if it's a thing that I didn't want, it's being handled really well. And I gotta say, I'm starting to actually kind of get excited about it because of the way uh, Secret Wars is being handled. Um, we're in this uh, weird topsy-turvy battle world place where we've got one world and it's uh, all of these different segments, it's segmented into all these different parts of the old Marvel Universe and, di and, and different Marvel Universes. And it was patchworked together, turns out, by Doctor Doom and Doctor Strange. And everybody worships Doctor Doom as unto a god, and he actually kind of is a god now. He's omnipotent. Um, he has created this world with the help of Doctor Strange. We find out here that, uh, and, and, and Doctor Strange uh, is the sheriff of the land. Uh, by the way, the, the whole thing uh, right now is playing like medieval fantasy with, 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 of course, some science fiction elements because of the characters that, you know, have that and, and are in there. So it's, it's, it's kind of a mix of all those different genres like it, these things often are. But uh, a lot of we've got a lot of kind of kind of heightened formal language and stuff. Uh, we've got a, a a big set of um, like century Thors. We've got Thors from all these different universes. Um, I don't know why all, all these Thors got to stick around, and we've got pretty much one of everybody else. Uh, but that's kind of fun. And um, anyway, so uh, so you got a uh, sheriff, Doctor Strange, and we find out here that he could have been um, a god or been god um, instead. Like they, they could have duped it out, uh, but he didn't want that, and so uh, Doctor Doom took it and. I just love how uh, layered and complex Hickman is making Doctor Doom's character. Uh, he is not just an evil despotic god, uh, you know, ruling everything. Uh, he really does seem to kind of care about the creation that he's made, and there's a lot of kind of the weight of the weight of kingship, the weight of power, uh, uh, the, the the weight of being in charge in this, uh, and how it's really hard on Doctor Doom, and he thinks that. Maybe uh, he's got a lot of he's he's uh, he's got a lot of uh, kind of broodiness and inner turmoil. Uh, but it's not like it's not obnoxious angst. It's it's somewhat understandable, and it's kind of interesting uh, that he's starting to a little bit second guess how he handled this. Where he's beginning to say maybe it would have been better if I, or at the very least, I understand why other gods uh, decide to work on faith alone and stay behind everything and uh, not be not show themselves to the common man, and uh, Doctor Strange is trying to give him really good reasons for walking among his subjects, and maybe he should be more part of the world instead of separate and above it. And uh, a lot of really interesting, um, sophisticated stuff about uh, about religion and um, about the definition of godhood, and uh, I just love how uh, uh, how much care has been put into this, and now um, we're starting to uh, bring in some of the characters that actually uh, uh, stuck around from 616. Uh, there was a at the beginning of this, just before this actually, uh, there was a big ship that was built, a uh, space station, 
I, I was it a station or I guess it was a big ship, and uh, there somehow or rather uh, uh, several heroes, not very many, uh, managed to survive the destruction of the multiverse, and uh, so all of these you know other versions were kind of recreated by Doctor Doom, and again uh, he's trying to patch, patchwork all of that together, um, and uh, he, he they basically the idea is they salvaged what they could, and then they um, and then they filled in the blanks, uh, but there's only this this collect this select handful that remember everything that happened and I imagine that moving forward once we get into a newly rebuilt 616 uh, which I'm sure will, will not be uh, um run by Dr. Doom with Dr. Doom as the godhead anymore. Um, I, w I, I would imagine, uh, as much fun as that status quo is right now, um, I would imagine that, that uh, some of those characters are still going to get to remember uh, what they know now. And uh, so this is a soft reboot uh, in the same sense as X-Men Days of Future Past, and I think it's being handled uh, with just as much care and kid gloves and, um, and creativity uh, where it all happened and it's not this, like, gimmicky reset thing where we get to just like pick and choose or at least you know there is picking and choosing but it kind of makes sense that I understand what's going on and I'm especially excited to understand what's going on in a Hickman comic uh, but it's uh, but I don't know right now I'm very excited about it and having um, uh, uh, and, and like like finding myself um, each issue really excited to find out what happens next and enjoying the mystery and, and, and not knowing where, um, where all this is going to uh, wind up. This is very much what Flashpoint kind of should have been uh, where you've got this really cool alternate reality, uh, but it's not just like this quick reset thing at the end where we get a tease of this really neat reality and then it's gone. Uh, we're really exploring it here, and it feels like it's we're having a real progression to what we're, we're going to be at later, regardless of what ends up getting wiped off the map. Uh, but as I said really happy with this right now. Um, I, I, I think it's a really fun read, and am also um, surprised by how much I care about the tie-ins this time uh, for, for, a, for a giant event, because usually uh, I, I try not to, you know, you know um, waste my money with too many tie-ins, because a lot of the time um, at least, you know, in years past, I think Marvel's gotten a lot better at them. Um, and, and, you know, DC, too. Uh, like, I got some of the conversion tie-ins and really enjoyed them, but um, with with a lot of the these uh, giant mega crossovers uh, that we, events that we've had in the past, I found myself, um, you, you know, you know, picking up a three, four dollar book and then uh, finding out that again, it's kind of just this this sort of um, gimmicky uh, way to. There's not a real great story being told, and it's kind of just there to try to you know get your three or four bucks again real quick. Uh, what we're getting with some of these uh, tie-ins going back to. Um, old events and reimagining them inside of Battle World, uh, like Doctor Doom is is the Godhead in in, in a lot of these, uh, and then just doing some other things too. Um, there, these stories are so far um, the ones that I've read have uh, been really really fun and interesting and engaging. And uh, you know, I resisted this idea of let's go back and rework all these uh, crossovers and uh, kind of you know, I uh, tried to rely on people's nostalgia for this stuff. Um, and of course, you know, sometimes I find myself buying that hook, hook line, sinker, even though I will complain about it, you know, where I'm like, where I'm like, yeah, dude, just try something new, you know, let's move forward. Let's not just keep going back to the well over and over again. And it's also really interesting, by the way, I'm jumping all over the place that uh, DC and Marvel did that simultaneously, uh, where, you know, with, with convergence, uh, it was, let's see uh, all these things from a lot of old events and different periods and stuff, uh, and try to, you know, you know, excite people with, uh, their favorite things and just do them again. Uh, and we, we did that simultaneously with Marvel, and um, but I I did I did like some of that stuff with Convergence. Um, certainly liking this stuff a, a bit more. And um, now I uh, will go ahead and talk about a couple of them. Uh, the first is uh, Amazing Spider-Man: Renew Your Vows. Uh, this is the first issue of this. A lot of people ask me if I would tackle this, and um, I gotta say, uh, enjoying this more than I thought I would. Uh, I was a little bit. Um, apprehensive about this because it's Dan Slott writing the Peter Parker Mary Jane relationship, which when he's done it in the past, um, I've I've often felt like it was kind of juvenile and uh, didn't really care for his take on Mary Jane as a character. Um, didn't really, really like their dynamic together. Uh, felt fanficy. Uh, this is not that. Um, I feel like he's matured a little bit lately. Uh, I've liked his amazing work um, since the uh, Doc Ock thing, and then uh, there's been some other things here and there that he's done that um, I've been like, oh, that's that's kind of okay. Um, so he's kind of found his groove, and I still 
am really hoping that after uh, the Secret Wars, that maybe somebody else will get a chance to try their hand at it, and that it won't be that that it that, that it won't continue to be Dan Slott every month. But um, this is working out better than I thought it would. So basically, the idea here is um, let's wipe out one more day and um, let's go uh, uh, to the future and see where Peter Parker uh, would have progressed if one more day had never happened. Um, now, of course, we're still in the middle of this battle world thing, and uh, there is he, he's in this um, he's in the status quo now where all of a sudden a whole bunch of superheroes have died and he's having to pick up the slack, and so uh, he's in this kind of like sad. Uh, situation, uh, he doesn't know it until right in the middle of this, but uh, he's got a family now, and uh, I like the way Dan Slott is, I'm surprised I'm saying this, uh, is, is writing uh, him and Mary Jane's um, exchanges and their banter, and uh, they have chemistry together. Uh, he, they've got a daughter who is um, not Mayday Parker, I thought maybe they'd go there, um, that's, that's not who it is. Um, this is um, a, a girl named, uh, what, Anna? Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember now, um, I think that's her name, is it Anna? It's Annie, okay. And, um, so, uh, basically the whole idea here is, um, Peter Parker trying to figure out how to, uh, be a superhero and have a family and have his family not be in constant danger, and it's kind of the, you know, the standard issues that, um, superheroes and especially Peter Parker have had to deal with before, where, you know, I have loved ones, and if my secret ever got out, you know, they, they uh, uh, they would be in, in great danger, um, but it's different when you have a kid, and I like how Slot is playing that, that it, it, there's even a big difference between um, I've got uh, I've got a wife or I've got a husband and I have a child uh, that depends on me and that that takes precedence um, over over anything else. And speaking as a parent myself, I, I found myself um, really buying into. Um, though I kind of questioned it a little bit at first, uh, uh, where Peter Parker gets to at the end of this uh, in deciding that he has more of a responsibility to his daughter than he does to any to, to anybody else, and all of a sudden the great power with great responsibility thing gets kind of skewed. Like like now, who do you have the most duty to? Uh, like 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 uh, what is the, your greatest responsibility, and um, he there's a there's a big fight with Venom in the, at, at the middle in the middle of this uh, that's that's exciting and dynamic, and um, he makes a choice that I that I really kind of question and still am finding myself questioning and going I don't I don't know if I like that he did that even in trying to protect his daughter um, but what I like is this is just the first issue and the story's not over and so uh, he has a, um, a character arc in this and kind of gets to a place at the end and says um, this is this is romantic. This is how I feel about things now, and um, let's move on. It'll be interesting to see if he continues feeling that way or not. I don't really want to make a judgment call about it yet because the story is not over. But anyway, um, overall, I, I kind of liked this. Uh, Slot kind of comes right out and on the very first panel addresses uh, fans kind of hatred of One More Day, and the very first text box is, in a perfect world, this was how it was always meant to be, and we have a, um, and we have a wall of family photos with, uh, Peter and Mary Jane's wedding photo right in the middle, and, um, I thought that was kind of a cool, classy way to handle this. Um, I really wish that uh, this would be the status quo for uh, Spider-Man moving forward. I would really like to see um, the the family dynamic continue. I, I, I never thought that uh, it held people back the way that Kasada and other people at Marvel um, felt like it did uh, back in the mid-2000s when, when all that happened with One More Day. Um, it, I think, from everything I've read uh, and, and and heard about, that they're probably going to reset him back to a teenager, or um, or at least write continue to write him that way, um, and that this is just kind of uh, you know a thing during this battle world thing, is kind of a wishful you know let's see it, but we're not really going to keep running with it. Um, I don't know. I feel like that would have legs, and that we could we could continue telling stories about that. And we've been doing the great power, great responsibility forever. Wouldn't it be interesting if uh, we now made it. Um, you know, you know, for for uh, for quite a while, um, more of a question of who exactly he has responsibility to, and if he can juggle that kind of life. Um, there's also a really good uh, argument here made for Peter Parker being an Avenger, uh, and uh, at least in the status quo that I really kind of liked. So um, anyway, overall, uh, yeah, not bad.
And then the other tie-in that I picked up was uh, Years of Future Past, and this is by, um, wow, people I don't really know, um, Marguerite, Marguerite ben, uh, Bennett and Mike Norton. Um, really love the art in this. Uh, nice throwback to Days of Future Past, especially Wolverine. Just looks a spitting image as he did in that book. Um, I really like how timeless this art is. Uh, it doesn't look like it's just aping that, and like it's trying to do it, but it's not But it's not quite, or, or that it's just that exactly. Um, it's kind of a nice blend of um, more contemporary artwork with that, and it feels really, really somehow kind of timeless. Um so uh, I don't know. I was really happy with the look of this whole thing. Um, it's it's uh, it's bleak and disparaging uh, because you know it's it's the post-apocalyptic future of uh, basically days of future past. And um, in this version, uh, most of the mutants have been killed off, and the and uh, you've got um, you've got uh, President Kelly. Um, you know, Senator Kelly, he's President Kelly now, and uh, he is uh, trying to keep this going and keep, keep the mutants down, and uh, there is a movement uh, to to uh, try to change the rules and um, make mutants uh, real citizens again and not make them second-class citizens. And Kelly is uh, doing everything he can to block that. You've got, of course, Sentinels everywhere. It's, 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 it's a very, very similar situation, of course, two days of future past. Um, what I really like... Uh, I, what I really like in, in this is kind of the X-Men's philosophy of how to handle this, uh, which is, uh, you know, the X-Men kind of in the middle of this all finally get themselves back together again, and the idea is they're going to try to change humanity's mind on mutants by helping them find their humanity again. Uh, that that um, everybody's kind of lost their way and that they uh, kind of have kind of lost their empathy and they've forgotten that mutants are people too and that uh, even the way they treat each other is kind of wrong. And so um, it's, it's, uh, it's this kind of more um, optimistic thing of um, instead of um, you know you know uh, uh, fighting back, and of course you know they do have to kind of fight back. Uh, but the but the idea is uh, that they're going to try to find a way to um, help humanity be humane again, be be human again, and um, kind of embracing Professor Xavier's philosophy without him there. Really like that. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say about this uh, until we see more of it, but um, I really enjoyed this overall, and. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll definitely get the next one. Uh, okay, let's go over now to DC, and we begin with... Uh, where do I want to start with this? Let's go ahead and start with um, a couple of number ones. We've got um, a couple of new miniseries, and I like uh, the, the new approach that uh, DC is taking, or at least some things about the new approach that DC is taking. Um, so so uh, we had the end of Convergence last week, and um, I actually have not read the last issue of that yet, uh, but I've read most of it. And um, we're getting this kind of new... Uh, uh, status quo in the publishing. By the way, I was really down on the first couple issues. Uh, I, I did a, a video about that here on the channel, and I was somewhat misinformed about what exactly Convergence was doing. I thought it was a little bit more important than it really was. I thought it was more of a reboot situation than it was and I was really irritated with how padded out those issues were uh, and how gimmicky I thought they were. Uh, the series got better. I was glad that it wasn't $5 every issue, and um, it, and, and, and the story um, did start to get more interesting and hold my attention, although I, I, I do have to say that it did continue to, as a lot of these DC events have in the last couple of years, focus on characters that I'm just not that interested in and had a hard time really caring all that much about. Um, but I uh, but I found the, the concept uh, really fascinating. There were some cool things done with it. So anyway, um. I will try to get a review out um, about that sometime in the near future. Um, the day, days of uh, future Captain Logan, uh, past, pre future. Um, anyway, so uh, there's 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 a couple things that they're doing now. Um, of course, they. Uh, they're, they're, they're bringing up uh, uh, some new titles. They brought some, they, they kind of changed up some continuity stuff a little bit. So we still have a whole lot of things from 52. Uh, like, like, like nothing got straight up re restarted, rebooted. Um, but we brought some things back and we're starting some new titles over. And we're kind of, I, it's not a straight up reboot, but we're doing this kind of halfway measure thing. Um, but I guess I like the halfway measure this time more than I did with 52, uh, where we're, we're uh, just doing some. Some more stuff that people actually seem to kind of want, and we'll see if that continues and how and how it works. But what I'm liking so far is that it's just not taking itself quite so 
gosh darn seriously, uh, and I really appreciate that. As evidenced by the fact that um, the very next week after Convergence, we put out a the first of um, a six-issue miniseries, both for Bizarro and Batmite. And regardless of whether or not you like either of these characters and you find them really irritating, the fact that there is a Bizarro and a Batmite book and that it's not the, the whole... Uh, uh, B zero nonsense thing that we did with Fifty Two, but it's actually Bizarro from Bizarro World uh, and straight up Batmite uh, tells me that they're listening a little bit to some of us and giving us more of a variety of things and not trying to make everything '90s Marvel, which I really appreciate. I know that was not a Fortean slip. I, I meant '90s Marvel because that's what Fifty Two has kind of been too much of. Um, I enjoyed both of these, uh, was not blown away by either of them, but, uh, Bizarro, uh, is, um, written by, uh, see, could we just, you know, I always say this, but can we please just put, um, the, the publishing information, you know, right at the beginning so that I know who wrote things and who drew things and, and stuff. Uh, anyway, I guess, uh, give me a second, I can't find it. Uh, oh, there we go, there we go, there we go, um... Heath Corson and uh, and uh, art by Gustavo uh, Duarte. Uh, one of the things I really, really enjoyed about this, uh, about Bizarro, is um, all of the, uh, the 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 kind of um, mixed up words and uh, saying everything in opposites uh, is done not just in Bizarro speak, but also in a lot of the publishing stuff. In um, like like uh, like it. It, uh, it opens and says uh, that like it starts at the end uh, it, it, like like uh, like this is uh, issue six this is part six of this story um, of, of issue story so everything everything is opposite I think it's really funny um, and then at the end uh, it says um, instead of uh, to be continued um, it's like to be to, to be started so that's really funny and um, I really enjoyed the way that uh, Bizarro's opposite speak was played up in this uh, and how irritating it is to other people around him trying to figure out what in the world he's talking about and of course it's not always consistent and that gets way on people's nerves um, this is Bizarro and Jimmy Olsen go on a road trip that's the story and Jimmy Olsen is kind of uh, allowing himself to become Bizarro's pal uh, to try to, um, first of all, get a story, but second of all, um, help him fit in better and try to find a place, because, of course, his heart's in the right place, and he's trying to do the right thing, but um, he's just uh, totally nuts and really likes breaking things and doesn't understand um, that... Um, fixing things and breaking things are not the same thing, and uh, that's Bizarro. And this is, you know, classic old school Bizarro. Um, really fun. The art is um, is really cartoony and um, and uh, really kind of kind of jagged and uh, and strange, and um, not exactly my cup of tea, but fits the material just fine. Uh, my favorite thing about this is the is uh, King Tut. Yeah, King Tut's in this, but he's not um, the same King Tut from 60s Batman. He's a used car salesman, and it looks like he's going to be the big bad through this whole thing. Um, I thought that was going to be a throwaway gag, and then he makes a deal with uh, someone and gets magic powers, and, uh, and, and um, I won't give away too much about how exactly that happens, um, but he uh, b but uh, he manages to uh, get some mind control and starts acting more like um, actual King Todd, and uh, he, his whole master plan is just to have a better quarter for his used car business. It's it's pretty funny. Uh, so yeah, th and uh, both of these really cartoony but adult cartoony. Um, like uh, like Batmite says hell and stuff. So like these are not exactly great for your kids. This one maybe maybe a little bit more so. Um, but they're. You know they're really they're really whimsical and silly and um but but it's 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 kind of more like like uh I don't know I'd say like like a, like low key Mad Magazine uh, kind of level like like a, like it's not I mean it's not real crude like Mad Magazine can be but it's more for adults and um not exactly for your kids uh, Bat might is an odd story, uh, or at least an odd beginning of this story, because um, it is not nearly as cartoony as this. This is one of those things, sort of like Squirrel Girl, where it's hard to it's hard to place it exactly in continuity, where like it, it technically counts and it's in continuity, but because it's so incredibly quirky and because it plays so much with the format and there's so much like like uh, like a little bit of break and forth wall and um, more, more from you know the narration side, uh, but but that kind of stuff, sort of like sort of like Deadpool can be sometimes where it's like. 
it's borderline where it's hard to see it as fitting in the same world and continuity as everything else. This fits kind of squarely in uh, DC continuity right now. This is Batmite dealing with a normal Batman kind of kind of plot, um, and it's and it's really strange. Uh, he's dealing with. Uh, a really uh, freaky, disturbing uh, kind of kind of uh, villain situation where there is uh, this um, evil plastic surgeon, and I don't know what it is about evil plastic surgeons in Batman, but there's a lot of them. And uh, there is this um, th there's this evil plastic surgeon who is uh, trying to stay young by putting her brain in different people's bodies. And uh, whenever a body gets too old, she transplants it into another body. And uh, like I said, it's like, this is like really messed up, disturbing stuff that you would kind of expect in maybe like a, a, a Snyder, a more, more horror-prone Batman comic. And I wonder if we're not um, kind of saying something about where Batman is these days by trying to take the quirkiness of Batmite and put it into that, uh, going, going as far as to having Batmite put on uh, a gray costume in order to look more like the, uh, the 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 darker Batman that we have right now, um, it was it's an interesting start, uh, kind of counterintuitive to what I thought um, would be here. It's not really funny, uh, which I'm, in my opinion, uh, which I'm, I'm kind of surprised by. I mean, sometimes Batman has some things here and there that are that are that are, that are sort of sort of funny um, lines, but it's kind of it's kind of just. He's just in character. Um, really interesting. Uh, this is a Dan Jurgens thing. Uh, Dan Jurgens, especially these days, kind of hit and miss. Um, I thought the writing was was fine. Um, don't know how I feel about the choice of, of, of story, just, just the story in general, and and, and and what's being done with this. Um, but uh, but now that I'm thinking about it, uh, the immortality thing, if it's played right, could be really interesting because Batmite. The reason he's here in the first place is he got exiled from um, his dimension. And he is kind of mortal now, um, or at least we're not told exactly how mortal he is. He seems to still sort of have his powers, but then uh, he can be, you know, imprisoned and stuff, and he can't get out. So he's got to be at least sort of mortal. Uh, and then we're dealing with somebody that's trying to be immortal. So I'm hoping that Jurgens takes that all the way and does some, excuse me, interesting uh, thematic stuff with that. Just a couple more for you real quick this week. Uh, we've got Green Arrow number 41, uh, which I really don't have a whole lot to say about, except, uh, first of all, really disturbing Joker cover. Uh, we're doing this, this uh, Joker 75th anniversary thing, and so there's some variant covers for that. Um, I, I like it, but um, it's, it's, it's disturbing. And um, anyway... This is a brand new story arc uh, with a new creative team that is uh, trying to kind of continue where uh, Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino left off. And it's bringing us back to uh, that kind of tone, uh, that kind of um, more street level um, uh, kind of uh, kind of gritty uh, sort of storytelling. And um, the art is uh, is not as great as Sorrentino's, but uh, certainly back in that vein, which I really appreciate. Um, this is once again trying to find where the the publishing information is. Uh, this is written by uh, Benjamin Percy with art by Patrick uh, Zercher, two uh, art two uh, creators that I am not immediately familiar with. Um, I like that we're bringing back the the uh, old. And I hate saying old because it just hasn't been that long, but um, but the uh, supporting cast from Lemire's run, uh, and they are um, they're back and uh, written uh, back in character, and um, it's it's uh, I don't know it's good. Um, I'm not like super excited about the situation yet. It's basically um, some people are disappearing, and Green Arrow is trying to figure out what exactly is going on, and um, it's uh, it's a sufficiently compelling mystery. Um, I'm mostly just interested right now in uh, getting back to this kind of urban atmosphere and that kind of thing. I like that we're uh, back in a street level place with this, and we're not starting with um, another like like a like big giant height thing like we had with the totems and stuff. And I mean, that, that was all really great and interesting. And of course, that's where they started. Um, but I was, was sort of hoping for more of a grounded, down-to-earth kind of thing. Uh, and that's what we've got right now. 
And I'll definitely be uh, hanging on to this for at least a while and seeing where it goes. Um, it does really make me miss Lemire. Uh, it's good. It's not Lemire good. Um, it, it's uh, like, like the writing is just not as punchy. But again, uh, it's broody, urban, street level, Green Arrow, and that's what I want from this book. So uh, excited to see where it goes from here. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, end now with uh, Batman Arkham Knight number five. And uh, before I get into this, I want to mention... Uh, before I forget, a couple of things that um, DC is doing right now that I'm not loving just as far as uh, what their books look like. First of all, uh, we've got New 52 off the covers now. Uh, of course, th this wouldn't have had it in the first place, but uh, but you know, with, with Green Arrow and, and, and this stuff. New 52 off the covers now. Um, and now that we've moved on from uh, Convergence, we're not calling it that anymore. Yay! It hasn't been new for a long time! But, uh, I don't know if I like what we're replacing it with anymore. Uh, we've got, now, we're we're calling this thing uh, DCU, and um, I don't I don't know what that means. I guess we have to have some kind of a banner um, to grab people's attention and and just say, uh, hey, we we have uh, we have a new um, kind of kind of editing mentality. Uh, come see what we're doing right now. It was like we always have to have some kind of a buzzword or catchphrase thing or something now. And I don't know why we can't just be DC and Marvel. Um, you know, Marvel for a while had had to be Marvel now, and I was loving Marvel now. I just don't know why we really had to call it anything. Um, although with that, I guess it made a little bit of sense because you know DC had fifty two. They wanted to kind of counter that with, we're keeping the continuity the same, but we want you to know that we've kind of changed our strategy a little bit. Um, and I guess they feel like here, they, 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 have to, they have to show you they've changed their strategy a little bit. So now we have DCU. I don't know what that means. Uh, you know, the first the first time I looked at that, I was like, so is it going to be more of an interactive thing? You know, like YouTube is about me making videos. Is it going to be like a choose your own adventure kind of thing? So then my wife, she was like, I would totally read that comic, the choose your own adventure comic book. Um, anyway, the other thing is uh, every single issue uh, published by DC this week had this irritating uh, Twix ad. I love Twix, but gee, really? An ad in the middle of pages with panels. No joke. I really like. I hope that this is not going to become a trend. Um, can cannot get excited about that. It's incredibly distracting. Uh, I'm reading this this page and there's uh, an ad in the middle of it. Uh, comics are m most of them four dollars now, and um, I don't like to complain about price uh, because I think that by and large everything I'm buying is worth four dollars an issue, uh, and I have I have accepted that that's what they cost now. But at the very least, could we not put ads in the middle of pages? Um, you, you know, somebody in uh, my documentary said even uh, um, Joel, uh, um, the the guy who runs uh, Astro Kitty Comics in Lawrence, Kansas, um, said if comics are going to be this expensive, uh, he said they're not they're not too expensive. But if they're going to be as expensive as they are, let's at least get ads out of them. And um, I can live with some ads, but I just right in the middle of a page like that, geez. And for some reason. Having it in the middle down there like that, because I know that we, we often have have you know ads on one side but not but but not the other. But having them across the page like that, for some reason, some of these issues I had a hard time telling if I was supposed to read straight across or if I was supposed to go down and then come to the next page. Um, I don't know. Anyway, so uh, Batman Arkham Knight number five. Um, so this book is it looks like gonna just have different story arcs. I kind of thought it was gonna be uh, just a just one long story arc until the game came out. It looks like it might continue. Continue being. I haven't looked into this. Uh, might continue being published uh, alongside, you know, the game's release, and um, that's kind of exciting. Um, this was great. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I love immersing myself into the Arkhamverse. Uh, I think that um, Tomasi is doing a pretty good job with this, and uh, Peter Tomasi, uh, his his uh, writing has sometimes been um, pretty hit and miss for me. Uh, but I think this is pretty great. Um, he writes a pretty good Bane. Um, I have said that before, and he's now. I will say that he's got to be careful because he writes he, he has written in other places if memory serves I think it was Tomasi um, a Bane for 52 boy I hope I'm not wrong about that I really feel like it was uh, but I mean I really think it was but um, anyway um, 
I thought he was the guy that wrote a Bane in, in, in 52 that kind of talked like the Tom Hardy version. And he's bordering that a little bit here, and the Bane in the Arkhamverse um, sounds, of course, a lot more like traditional Bane and doesn't really have um, as much of that, like, a... Uh, like a ultra dramatic theater thing uh, where he just goes on and on and on uh, and everything is a speech that it seems like he rehearsed in the shower uh, but but uh, but anyway um, this one isn't quite like that but there's places where he's bordering on it he's gonna be, need to be a little bit careful about that um, th everything about the situation is interesting uh, at the very beginning we've got um, we've got a Bruce Wayne and Oracle or sorry uh, Barbara Gordon but but in a wheelchair because we have Oracle in this and um, yay for that. Part of the reason I love, by the way, reading the Arkhamverse um, alongside having the games is that this is a more traditional kind of 90s Batman world. And of course, 90s Batman is my favorite thing. So we've still got Oracle. And um, she she does, by the way, um, a really a really fun thing in this uh, where she uh, where she takes out a thug in her wheelchair. That was kind of fun. Um, but anyway, uh, so we've got, we've got her and Bruce Wayne trying to convince Jim Gordon to run for mayor. And, uh, I'm assuming that that's going to play into the game somehow. That's kind of interesting. Uh, and then we've got Bane, uh, at the, toward the end of this, just trying to straight up come back in and try to take over Gotham and break the bat again. And, uh, some really fun dynamite action. Um, I, I once again, enjoyed everything about this. Uh, you've got a lot of villain machinations, um, different people doing things at the same time. Uh, yeah, maybe a little convenient that so many of them are trying to operate at, at once. Uh, Penguin is doing a thing and, you know, you've always got to, with the Arkham games, you got to have every villain coming in and doing something um but i uh, despite that i i really enjoyed this and um there's a couple things that happen here that seem like uh they would influence the game really hard and am kind of surprised by them and will be interested to see if they if, if the game really is that way and if we're plotting that closely uh because a couple of uh, kind of game changers here one big game changer in particular as far as the geography of gotham uh so we'll we'll, we'll see what that's like uh when when we play play Arkham Knight. Uh, anyway, that's going to be it for me this week. I guess I will, as I have done in time past, pick my favorite book, uh, my, my favorite issue of the week. I actually have not done that yet, um, so I'm going to look through here for just a second and try to decide what I think was my favorite issue of the week. I am going to go with, boy, it's a toss-up. Um, I'm going to go with Secret Wars, number three. Um, yeah, I... Uh, really dense uh, these issues so far and um, really thought provoking um, I'm I'm really interested in this uh, God doom stuff uh, it's kind of it, it, it's kind of got my mind going I'm really I'm really I'm really into that uh, that is cool and then I uh, favorite cover this week um, I mean you've always gotta love the creepy emperor happy face uh, but I'm gonna and then I mean, I said it was disturbing, but like, and because it is, but like, suction cup arrows on joke. I don't, I don't know. Um, that that is not my favorite cover. Um, it's it's simply bizarre. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Darth. Vader. I'm gonna cop out and 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 say that um, that a uh, creepy happy emperor face kind of always wins. Uh, anyway, everybody, thanks so much for watching. Sure, appreciate it. I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed this set of reviews. And um, like I said, I'm gonna try to come back and keep doing this for you. Um, the the brief thing clearly didn't work out so well. Uh, but uh, but we've got but we've got a video. And um, now you know. Um, what I read this week, and um, hopefully it helps you decide what you want to pick up at the store this week if you haven't been yet. Uh, if there's anything you'd like me or Vince to review on the Comic Vault, we'll try to get to things as soon as humanly possible. We got a big stack of stuff um, still from uh, from the uh, from the PO box going back a couple of years. But um, if you ever want to send us anything, you can always send stuff to our PO box. That's Geek Solution PO Box four seven three three Overland Park Kansas six six two zero four. I will be back with you again very soon with more content here on Geek Solution. I'm uh, gonna go work on Rewind right now, and um, thanks so much for watching. I'm Captain Logan, and happy reading!